So, so who here brought the list of expectations that they had for the semester? One, two. So, so we, we wrote these expectations of the first lecture, and then we're supposed to remember those. We got three, four. If we don't have a majority, we won't do it. I mean, we can do it next week because if if no one has them, then this is a pointless exercise. So <laughs> maybe I should ask a different question. Who here has those sheets at all? Like, like, think you could find them? So raise your hand high because we have arms. Okay, so less than half the class has, let's say half the class has them. All right, so you guys up in the back don't have these at all. Is that correct? No. <laughs> yeah. So if you don't have these, um, I guess we'll skip over this activity. The, I'll tell you the, the punchline. So here's the punchline. So at the beginning of the semester, you didn't know what the class was going to be about, but you probably wanted to be here for summer, I hope. Um, and so the goal was that we would write down those expectations and then figure out whether or not we know we're, we're almost towards the end of the semester. So what is it that you have gotten out of the class so far, and what do you want to get out of the class, right? So it's sort of a midpoint reevaluation. So we will do this part. Um, so what have you want to learn and what have you not yet learned? So this is going to be turn to your nearest partner and talk to them for like two or th two minutes. We'll give you two minutes. Talk to your partner about what is it that you've learned and what do you want to learn. So this is a socialization exercise. So what do you what have you learned? What do you learn? All right, so take another 30 seconds and then we'll wrap it up. Let's finish up your thoughts. So we'll get to that. Okay, so now for the, so this would have been the third part of the exercise, and that's going to be the second. So now you've had a little bit of time to brainstorm with your partner. Now we're going to do a solo activity. The solo activity is I've handed you a piece of paper that's blank. You're going to take a pen or pencil. If you need one, let me know. And you're going to write down what it is that you want to learn. What are your remaining expectations at the, for, this, for the remainder of the semester, right? You've got me for like five more lectures. So what do you want to extract out of me? And so you're going to turn these in. So last time we didn't turn in the beginning of the semester papers to me. This time we're going to turn these in at the end of class. So 
this is your opportunity to write down what it is you think you need to get out of this class because you're not going to see me after five lectures. So, I mean, I will still be in Catonsville, but <laughs> I will disappear into the ether. Yes. <laughs> you're welcome to email me. My response time might be higher. <laughs> Okay, so take your time. This is now a solo activity. Write down what it is that you want to get out of the rest of the semester, and you're going to turn it in at the end of class. <laughs> That's good. That's fine. You don't have to turn anything in. If you don't want to get anything out of the rest of the semester, that's fine. I will still talk at you. So while you're while you're pondering, like uh, last semester, I had some people ask more about visualizations, and so if you ask about visualizations, I'm gonna put the question back on you. What about visualizations do you want to know? So, do you want a review of the basic ones that we've covered? Do you want to see more of what's possible? Do you want to see some fancy stuff? Right. So try and be specific in your guidance, because if you just say more visualizations, that I, I can do that, but I need more specificity to be useful. All right, so you can continue to write things down uh, as the lecture goes on. I'll collect those at the end of the lecture, so no pressure to get it all in. But um, I'm going to move forward with the lecture content so we can get a little bit done tonight. By the way, so I don't think with, with Linda's part and with this little activity of collecting your information, I may not get through all of the lecture content. If, if that's the case, we'll push it into sort of the end of the semester uh, of backfill lecture. All right, so I'm going to be talking about graphs this evening. These are uh, things that look pretty sometimes. Other times they look very messy. There's a bit of math involved, so that's always exciting. Um, so it, it, if you've seen these before, <laughs> um, don't feel bad. This is your introduction. All right, and I'll let you know we're about two thirds of the way through the semester, so we've got a few lectures left. Um, they're sort of like the, the exciting ones that, like, we've basically talked about what I would call small data up to this point, things that you could effectively manipulate by hand, and maybe a little bit of medium data where it's bigger than you'd want to work with by hand, but still wouldn't be considered big data. So these, the, the end of the lecture is aiming more towards big data. We're not actually going to do a bunch of big data analysis, but sort of getting into that mindset. All right. Um, some of you may have started working on project two. That would be good. Um, the, the idea is that in the next lecture, you're going to have those turned in on Monday. And then in class, we'll do an activity that focuses on reproducibility. So I'm going to do a bunch of work that will prepare for that to get basically your notebooks online. And then we'll see if we can reproduce the work that you've done. So we'll, we'll learn more about that. Um, and for my sake, if you want to help me out, in your project, you should be loading the data from a URL as directly as possible. So whether that means request or beautiful soup or pandas, however you get the data in there, um, downloading the data is, is useful uh, for me. All right. Okay. Questions on project two? So we can still like upload our data set and stuff. What do you mean by that? Question. Uh, 
Um, so, so you do or do not have hypotheses that you want to test? You do not have hypotheses? Okay, so then you should meet with me. Those are important. So that was part of the proposals to get your hypotheses. But so email me and we can meet uh, at some point. Okay, anything else? Basically, the, it's the same sort of data characterization and visualization that we did for project one, plus validating or invalidating the claims about the data that you made. Basically, sanity check of, is the data behaving the way I expected? The answer is either no, because the data is wrong, or no, because I didn't understand what was in the data, or yes, the data hypothesis was correct, because I do understand the data, and it's behaving how I want. So those are sort of the potential outcomes. Uh, a, a hypothesis that turns out to be negative, like that was a wrong guess, that's not a bad thing, right? I'm not going to like downgrade you just because you your hypothesis turned out to be incorrect. That is not in part of the grading. My goal would be, can you quantitatively address the hypothesis? All right. So we, we've primarily, in this class so far, worked with lists and tables. And so we're going to work with a new data structure that sort of builds on those. Uh, it's, it's, a way of, it's a different way of thinking about the problem, as well as like working with the data. So it's a bit of a change. You don't always have to work with graphs. graphs have their cost, and we'll, we'll compare the costs and benefits. Um, and then hopefully we'll get to an activity where you get to work with the visualizations of graphs. So this is like a very common problem. Graphs are easy to like think in terms of and like make small pictures of, but once you get into any real size data set, the visualizations break down, which means you sort of lose that advantage of being able to see it. So we'll explore that. All right, so if you haven't heard of uh, graphs, but you have to give a little context. These are all. This is a little survey of all the different data structures we've worked with so far. It's quite a few, right? Like, a lot of people hadn't seen dictionaries before. Those are new. We haven't touched too much on tuples very often, um, and strings and scalars. Hopefully, you're familiar with. All right. So we have talked quite a bit about tables, and we'll see things like this, where like there's uh, an entity and some column, and then there's another set of people, and then there's some sort of like duration. Right? So this is like a very standard table that you might run into. And tables can get pretty complicated, because relations between things can be pretty complicated. So um, not too shocking here. I mean, like this is what we use tables for, typically. But there are all these, these alternatives, right? Tables are great for like storing the data. But they don't really capture the the es essence of what's going on, right? Like they're not very understandable if you're not a computer. So one way of thinking about the relationships between people is to make them into little mathematical objects. Where so we have nodes and edges. This is the the new words. If you haven't been exposed to these before, this is your the words you should memorize. And the concept of graphs are nodes and edges. So this is basically the thing that you're relating to something else. That's the node. And then the edge is the relation between them. So it's some sort of capture of that idea of a relationship. Um, so here, I've drawn a little, picture, a little picture of what a graph looks like. And then I'm enlisting all the nodes that are present in that graph and the edges. Edges are always pairs between nodes for our simple graphs. All right. And then there's some words. So <laughs> there's a lot of words that overlap, and it can be confusing. So I apologize in advance for that. But basically, um, one way of distinguishing networks from graphs. Right? So graphs are typically the mathematical construct. And the, the networks might be the things in the physical world. So that's sort of like a subjective decision. Like You could partition those off, but often people mix those two words back and forth. So if they say networks, just Maybe, maybe you mean graphs also, right? So uh, a minor distinction, but something you'll hear sometimes. So these graphs are like nice and pretty to look at, but it's hard for a computer to use. And so there's this equivalent representation called an adjacency matrix. And, and this is not so pretty for humans, right? But it, it is what, human, what computers work with. So we have to have a way of translating between what the humans like to see and how the computers operate. 
So the adjacency graph is basically the idea that for every single node in the graph, there is or is not an edge between those two nodes. And that's all this is capturing. Right? So this is like a big scary matrix, but all it really says is like between K and E, there's a one. So it's like a we're turning it on, so there is an edge in place. And then if we look at our graph, hopefully there's K and E, and they have this line between them. So that's all we're reading with this adjacency matrix, is the fact that there is or is not a relationship. All right. Uh, pro what does proximity mean to you? Yeah, yeah. So, so that th this is a, it's a very there's like a rabbit hole to go down there. So it's it's so two comments. One is you'll notice here I've made the choice of either there is or is not an edge. In the future slides, we will get to the concept of what does it mean for there not to be a one here, right? What if it's something other than a one? What would that mean? <laughs> the other um, observation that you're making is that how we lay out the graph um, isn't actually to the adjacency matrix. Uh, let's see, is that? No, I didn't get there. So I thought it was my next slide, hopefully, but it's not. So the layout uh, of this visual graph and the adjacency matrix are unrelated. So like you could rotate this, you could stretch it, you could change how far these are. In this visual representation, the distance between them and the specific like xy coordinates of the node are not relevant to the adjacency matrix. So that's kind of a convenience and kind of a hindrance because it means there's like an infinite number of visual representations of the same graph that are all equivalent. Some are prettier to look at than others. And that is a very, very subjective art of like what is the appropriate layout of a graph visually because they're all equivalent to the adjacency matrix. Yeah, so both options come from here, like, well, what about the actual layout? OK, so here's a trick. Um, <laughs> like, This is your first tip for the evening. Uh, when we have an undirected graph, that means like whether I'm between F and M or M and F, if that doesn't matter, it's called undirected. And in that case, the adjacency matrix has this really nice property of it's symmetric about the diagonal. So that mean all so what does that mean? Like how do we how do we interpret that? That means that between H and D there's an edge. And between let's see if I can pop up there. So H and D, there's also an edge. And that's the same edge. Right? They're just equivalent. Mm, not no. <laughs> a correlation matrix and a graph are not equivalent. But so the point here is that. Because the order of the pair in the edge doesn't matter, then the graph is symmetric. Just a little observation. OK, so I've used the word graph. You may have heard other people use, like, I've got an Excel chart with a graph in it. Right? Who here has heard that? OK, th four people, great. So if you were using Excel and someone says, show me the graph, they don't actually mean the thing we were looking at. And so maybe sometimes they say chart, which is another perfectly reasonable word, or figure, right? All of these words, they get sort of interchanged. So what's the difference? <laughs> it's a mess. That's all I have to say, right? All of these things are treated as equivalent to everything else. And hopefully, if someone says graph, they give you context to do they mean this or do they mean this, right? So if you're talking to a mathematician, they have very strong opinions that this is a graph. Right? But if you're talking to an office worker who's been in the office for 20 years, they mean this. Right? And mathematicians usually don't work in the office, so we're good to go. <laughs> so, so that's a problem. right? When you communicate with someone, you'll have to figure out, if I say the word graph, what do, they think that, what do I think they're going to mean? Right? Like, how are they going to interpret what I'm saying? So this is just like a heads up. If you're talking to people who don't know that there are all these different options that are interchangeable, everyone will be confused. Because you'll be saying the thing that you think is right, and they'll hear something different, but they don't have any context, and so everyone's confused. OK. All right, so <coughs> why would we get this? Right. So we've already got tables. We're comfortable with tables. We'll just keep using pandas. Right. And no need to learn graphs. <laughs> OK, so I've, in my experience, 
posing the problem as a graph actually changes the way in which you think about the problem. And that's super important, right? If you're stuck in the tables mindset, then the types of things that you will do with that data are different. And I, I can't explain like why that is, like some sort of emotional reasoning or something, I'm not sure, but it actually causes you to think differently about the problem. And being able to visualize things is super helpful, right? Like if you're visualizing how this social network of the class is related, like, you know, not everyone is friends with everyone else. And so what does that graph look like? That's just a cool thing to look at. And it can help you solve problems pretty quickly. Because humans are really good at visualizing things and solving problems visually if you can visualize it. That's not always going to be the case. And then <laughs> this last one, like, not to be um, negative, but, like, some people, they see a pretty picture and, like, they just stop thinking. And so <laughs> sometimes if you slip in the right picture, they're just like, ah, oh, and like they don't actually get anything, but they like stop thinking. So another thing that they be aware of. They don't come without problems, right? So like sometimes when you visualize a network, and let's say this is like every single student at UMBC, right? And how they know every other student at UMBC. It'd be a what's called a hairball. Right? This is an actual technical term, hairball. So you can throw that around. Um so this is pretty typical for Graphs that are large with lots of connections, they're hard to visualize. And so typically we try to avoid that scale of problem. That will hopefully be a, an activity this afternoon. But um, <coughs> And then your computer has to take time to figure out what is the appropriate layout. Right? We're talking about like, the different layouts that are possible and like where the points sit. That affects how the graph looks. And so your computer tries to optimize that. And that takes a long time. Like for large graphs, weeks. Right, rendering a graph is very hard. Okay. All right. So why do I? Why am I trying to like talk you into thinking about and using graphs? Like, what's my motive? Well, the first one um, that comes to mind is that if you're a credit card company and you're looking for unusual behavior, and you're given this huge table of like this person went to this store and bought this thing for this much at this time, right? Another person went to this store at this time, bought this much, and spent this much, right? So you've got this huge set of tables of people buying things at times from, you know, for certain cost. And so what you really want to find is who is an outlier, who is unusual, right? If we can figure out this person's behavior doesn't look like anyone's else, right? And that would be very hard to predict, potentially to see from a from an Excel table. But potentially, if you lay it out with some sort of graph, <coughs> and you say visually. This graph, this this node on the graph doesn't look like any other nodes. And maybe it's got more connections, so the bad guy goes to more um, stores, right, and buys more things, right? Like that's potentially a, a way of seeing that very quickly. Um, and then if you want to like a bad actor, and 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 who else is living with them, right? Like that would be pretty easy to pick out if they're both buying from the same person and they're shady. They live together. They're conducting bad business, right? Like you can pick these things out by their relationships. So that's one idea. Yeah, and then so like just different behaviors. So like the first example there was like association is pretty easy to pick out. Um, similar behavior um, is associated with bad things also. So like maybe you have uh, one type of buying behavior for normal people and then another type of behavior for people who are bad actors. All right, and then uh, just to show you, like, the versatility, graphs are applicable almost everywhere, right? And, like, places where you wouldn't expect there to be relations, like in text. So we think of text as, like, word, 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 period, word, 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 right? So that's, like, a sequence of words in a list. But you could think of it as a graph in the sense that if two words show up together nearby in the same text, they're probably related, right? And now we have a graph, right? So words that are near like distance-wise near each other, that can be used as a graph and say those two topics, because they show up together all the time, are probably related in some way. So measuring the distance between words is one way of looking for similarity of topics. And then you can throw that in your machine learning algorithm and be successful. <laughs> all right. And then <laughs> this is uh, you know, hope. I don't. I don't know how to measure whether or not everyone knows this, but your information, because 
I don't think, who, who here is not on Facebook? I'll ask that. Anybody not on Facebook? All Facebookers. Look at that. <laughs> and all the things that you like, and all the posts that you make, and all the um, interactions that you have on Messenger, all of those, right, are feeding into a giant graph database. It's amazing. Now, why would Facebook care about all the relations between people? Because what they really care about is who do they have to advertise to to influence a decision, right? So if someone is important in the graph, they have more connectivity, they have more interactions, that person could influence other people around them. And so your advertiser, people who are selling products, want to get to those influencers. They want to know who's important. Let me sell something to them. Because once I sell something to you, you're much more likely to recommend it to a friend, right? Would I trust an Amazon review or Cam's recommendation on what kind of water bottle to buy, right? Cam is probably much more closer because he's physically here and I can trust him and I see that his product is nice, right? So he's acting basically as a salesperson once he's bought the product. So we want to find those influencers. Advertisers are chasing this graph data all the time. And there are companies like this one that sell the data to everyone else, right? So like the, the challenge is how do you collect the data? How do you store it? How do you represent it? How do you make it accessible? And then how do you put value into it to make sure that people can buy your product? So if you want to look for graph work employment after this, you're going to be looking in advertising. That's primarily where people are looking. <coughs> Let's see. Yeah, so that's just more of the same idea. All right. Oh, we should take a break. It's actually 8, isn't it? <laughs> I almost got thrown off. Let's take a break. And we'll come back at 7.08. few questions in my proposal and you okay. asked me to convert them into hypothesis. Yes. So uh, how to do it? I... Okay, so you have questions. Yeah. Do you have expectations about what the answer will be? Yeah. Okay. I have expectations. So then if you write down those expectations and they quantified, then those are hypotheses. So uh, I should prove them my expectations were correct in the notes. Or incorrect. Okay. Yeah. So the goal is to set up sort of like, I think this is going to happen, and then I can use Python to figure out whether or not it's true or not. So my, my data is mostly about uh, non non motorcyclists data who have uh, been met with an accident and okay. want to make it count. So uh, my data is mostly like on this kind of street, more accidents. Uh, my questions were like, I uh, on which street most of the accidents have been taken place, okay. and uh, what were the road conditions when the uh, accidents have taken place. So my answers would be like when the road was uh, when the road was wet, more accidents have taken place. So this is my answer to the question. So uh, will you know whether it, does the uh, weather data include like whether the road is yeah, wet? It, it is a surface condition. Okay. It's a column Got it. in my data. So your expectation so is that? My expectation is that uh, when the surface is wet, more accidents have taken place. So this, okay. is, my, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this is what I'm expecting. Now how to convert into an hypothesis? Well, that, so that is a hypothesis that it is there are more accidents when the surface is wet. Okay. And I'm going to push you to go further, which is would that difference be something like 10% more accidents or twice as many? Can you quantify what the expectation is? I, don't, I know that you don't know, don't know what the answer is, but let's say, like, what would you think that the answer could be? Right? Would it be 10% more? OK, so this is the hypothesis. It means 50% uh, more uh, accidents took place when the surface was wet. This should be the hypothesis. That's, that's a guess. Right? It's a quantified guess. And then you can use Python to figure out whether or not you're right. Convert this and send you again to my proposal. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, my data has uh, many uh, missing values. Okay. So I can't remove them because I have to do analysis on that particular problem. Yeah. Or I can't uh, fill them up using some interpolation. So, so is the time? Well, so <laughs> this gets back to the homework that we did, right? Can you interpolate data? Because is the time? Is it? No. Is it really time series data? No. 
Okay, so order doesn't matter. So then interpolation wouldn't be a good technique. No, not in, uh, I'm, uh, I'm saying that uh, I can't fill up those values. That leave them I would, well, so if you do not fill them in, can you do your analysis? Yeah, I can. So then so you. A uh, few columns I have to drop and few columns I have to leave them like that. Well, why do you need to drop the columns? Because I have uh, 3,000 rows in my data yeah. and almost 2,800 uh, rows have no values. Yeah. So, uh, so what's, the, what's the problem? I won't be getting my information out of that. So, but what? So, in my but why do you need to drop them? Okay, sure. Should I leave them? Like There's no reason to drop them, as far as I know. You have mentioned in the proper means, uh, in, proper, in yeah. the proposal, in the rubric, project rubric, it is mentioned that uh, what kind of uh, challenges we have faced while cleaning the data, but I don't have anything to clean. So, so you have nothing to clean? Yeah. No, okay. So uh, then you should be able to show that your data is clean. Okay, so I should be able to show it. So, so either the clean it. Requirement would be matched. I mean, uh, whether the requirements would be satisfied. I don't have anything to clean, but so. But then you have to show that the data is clean. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In my project, I have doubt regarding these. The the circuits are only two circuits, single circuit and double circuit. So I don't, I'm not sure what the data is. Yeah, I don't know. My data is regarding the California electric transmission. Ah, yeah, okay. Here are the KV salt, ownership, status, and mm -hmm. circuit. Okay. In the circuit, we have only two types of circuits. Okay. Single circuit and double circuit. Okay. And if we have, we'll have many. Sorry, what was it? But uh, here there's uh, like Liberty Energy, double, double, it's uh, name is uh, different. Okay. Missing so that means. Missing. Can I. Mean it's missing. It looks like it's a misspelling. Yeah, misspelling. Yeah, so you have, you have, you could correct that. Yeah, we can co convert the, okay, I can change this name to double yeah. in that row. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And here, quad. That's four. Yeah, uh, it's a, uh, means a single circuit and double circuit. And in more than uh, two or three, they'll call us many circuit. <laughs> but what can I do? Just do you like this. <coughs> Excuse me. So this looks like. There's a mistake. So yeah, Liberty yeah, Energy, yeah, that's yeah. clearly there's something wrong. Yeah. Double is misspelled. Misspell. Quad is four, and this is many. Yeah. So what's the problem? Can I change these two to double and many? Why, why do you want to do that? Yeah, this one is misspelled. Yeah, yeah, so you want to change that one. Yeah. But why do you want to, like, can you just leave this here? Just leave it like that. Yeah. Yeah, then I And again, I want to know about this here also. Okay. It's in the lines are, uh, these are types. Okay. Types means there will be an OH and uh, UG lines. Okay. In OH. <coughs> so OH is okay. UG is in capital UG. And okay. here a small UG also present. Can okay. I change so this rename small that? UG to yeah. UGA capital yeah. UG? And now my expectation is to sort ownership and KV sort. Means okay. I want to I want to know how the means suppose take a company P J and D. Okay. He is doing how many means uh, how many he is reproducing how many KVs one KV generation. But you, you well you wouldn't sum those. Yeah, I will show you my expectation. I want to mix a high voltage and low voltage means I want to know that company is providing how much of voltage is means high voltage how much and low voltage how much. So we get we have to resume class. Let's can we do this after class? Yeah. Okay. And again my assignment also just a small mistake. Okay, we gotta start class so after the class. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so to answer April's question from earlier, this is what I wanted to get to, but apparently it was a little later in the slide deck than I thought. So basically, there are ways of laying out the graph that make it easier to understand. So these two graphs are equivalent, but it's much easier to see from this one that these two edges and nodes are off. Right? They're, they're separate from the rest of the graph, whereas that's not as obvious over here. So the point is that the layout matters to interpretability. And so this is what your computer, like you're going to have to tell your computer to optimize for 
visual interpretability. That's a goal, right? So late matters. All right. So I'm going to cruise through a couple tools that we use to look at graphs just to get a uh, sort of feel for the visuals. Um, the one that I always start out with, because it's super simple, is called Graph Viz. Very obvious name, right? Graph visualization. So let's take a look at that. Uh, fit it open. All right. So I've got Graph Viz as a library. I'm going to import that. And the first, oh, let's make it bigger. You have a question? No question? <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm going to. So Knights of the Round Table, that's like a, a fable, right? Uh, sorry. Um, so I have my graph, is, I'm going to call it the Round Table. And so I have three people in my graph, um, King Arthur, Sir Bedivere, and Sir Lancelot. And so basically uh, the first few lines here, I'm saying there is a graph, there are nodes, and the nodes have two things, like a, 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 a computer label, this is just like a short label, and this is sort of the text that will be displayed on the node. We'll come back to that um, later. And I'm basically going to provide a list of edges. So A and B and A and L, those are my edges. All right, so let's run that. And then I can say, what does this source look like? So the cool thing is GraphViz has its own language. This is a domain-specific language. It's, they are all over the place. So this graph, um, the thing that we just created in Python, can be rendered in this dot language. And so this is specifying how the graph is uh, existing in, in GraphViz. So the convenient thing is, although there is source code and we can take that and give it to other programs, which is pretty common, we're going to stick in Python and, and make a PNG, a, a little picture of what that looks like. All right, so when I make that graph, this is what it looks like. Super simple, right? So we've got three people. They all know each other. That's what my edges here are defining. And I've got a graph with the text. So that's, hopefully this is like inspirational and you're like, wow, I have a bunch of things I could do with graphs, right? <laughs> Probably not. All right, so let's do something a little bit more exciting. So we've got mom and dad's son, okay? So we can lay these things out. And so what I've been playing with in this one, uh, yeah. Let's see, I think, yeah, by that. Uh, I changed the layout here, basically. So I can constrain, well, so the difference between these two graphs is that there's a constraint, and that's where I'm specifying what the layout is, whether the triangle looks like this or like rotated. So you have to play with um, the, the layout engine in GraphViz. So these are both three node graphs, and but the layout is different. Okay, so graph is, all right, let's take a look at PyDot. All right, so PyDot allows you to work with um, graph viz, but in a way that allows you to do um, in integration with Python. And so here we're basically looping over um, a bunch of edges, and we're adding edges to the graph in Python, rather than what we're doing up here, which is manually specifying things. So here we're just saying, like, add all these nodes and edges. We could do the same in a loop. And so the advantage to that is that we can build large graphs without having to specify each individual node and edge. So just a quick, cool use of there. All right. I think that's all I have. So this is basically my intention here was to give you enough code to be dangerous. You could go construct your own graphs with GraphBiz now. Let's the burn. All right, quiz time. Oh boy. <coughs> all right, so there's four quizzes in this lecture. If we get to all four of them, um, they don't count towards your course grade, so don't feel like super pressured at being right. Just want to be uh, paying attention, basically. All right, so we've talked about undirected graphs, right, and we. Uh, have here an, a, a graph with nodes and edges, and <coughs> we have an adjacency matrix with one missing value. And so the question is, what is that value? So, all right. Anyone want to explain how they got that? 
Yeah. All right, so I heard a bunch of different answers. One is it's symmetric about this diagonal. So if you see that this is 0, this is also 0. Right? The other way of sort of getting yourself to that answer is we look between B and C. There is no edge, therefore it's 0. Right? So straightforward, good stuff. All right, so that's the trick. All right. <coughs> let's see, we have 24 people. I'm going to count off by 12, get you into different partners. All right, so let's start over here. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay, so take your number and your other number, same number. <laughs> no, eight? <laughs> Eight would have been over here ish. For you, eight? <laughs> All right. So, this would be a pretty quick check in. Just describe what you've covered so far, what you've learned. All right. From the lecture content so far with your partner. Okay, take about 30 more seconds and then we'll come back. All right, let's come back to our desk. <laughs> come back to your desk. All right, so 
<laughs> I will reiterate in case you haven't noticed in this class, I'm trying to force you to build relations with other data scientists in the class. Right? <laughs> and so the, the reason for that is this is, I think, probably the highest concentration of data scientists you'll be exposed to um, as you move forward through life, right? After you leave VM UMBC, you will not be in a room with as many data scientists unless you're at a conference, right? Conferences are different. But, so this is an, a chance for you to build relationships. And unlike conferences, the, the disciplines that you all will go into is, are highly varied, right? You don't know at this point probably where you're going to work. But when you leave here, you will still know the people in this room pretty well, right? You'll have known the struggles that you went through in Ben Payne's class, blah, 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 right? So the, the point is, when you leave here, someone will be working in like oil, you know, like mining industry or like oil collection. Other people were working in HR, right? Someone will be working at Facebook, right? Like you'll be in all these different places. And the nice thing is, you'll still be able to talk to each other, but only if you have something other than UMBC email addresses, right? <laughs> so my suggestion is, in addition to building relationships in here, I would suggest finding a way to connect with the other students in some manner other than umbc.edu email address. So whether that's LinkedIn or Gmail or whatever you want to use, find a way to connect with your peers while you're here so that after you leave here, you still have that connectivity. Yes, <laughs> that will exist. <laughs> huh? Uh, something like December 2nd, I think. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to transition to another demo. <laughs> Sorry, don't give yourselves the email addresses right now. Like, <laughs> have to keep paying attention. All right. All right. All right. So I showed you the the little baby network visualization tool called GraphViz. Now we're going to move up to its big brother called Network X. Network X is not quite as pretty. But the fancy thing is it has a bunch of mathematical algorithms built into it. So that's pretty handy. Um, because typically when you're working with graphs, visualizations won't get you um, the solution that you want. All right, so look at the um, <laughs> network X. That's the tool that we're going to use. We're going to build a graph. Um, <coughs> it's pretty similar syntax. Like you want to add edges, you want to add nodes, same concept. And then the, the fun part is we can show our graph that we've built. So here we've built um, specifically nodes with labels 1, 2, and 3. And then we've added an edge between 1 and 2. And for whatever reason, it decided to lay out the graph like this. So not super exciting, but so like you get the point. Right? All right, so now the fun thing is we can look at the adjacency matrix from the graph. Right? Those are interchangeable. Um, in this case, the agency matrix is probably easier to read than the graph, but um, that's not always the case. So um, that's something that GraphViz doesn't have, right? GraphViz doesn't have an internal representation of what the adjacency matrix is. All right, then we can add more edges, and then we can redraw that graph, right? So now we've got a triple, and then we can look at that adjacency matrix. So every edge, or every node is connected to every other node, but no node is connected to itself. That's what the adjacency matrix says. Another cool feature in Network X is that you can create random graphs. So here I'm creating a 10 node graph with a 0.2 probability, I think, of having an edge. So it basically decorates the, the edges in between the randomly generated nodes. So that's pretty straightforward, right? not too surprising. And then we can look at the shape and the matrix. All right, let's skip over that. All right, so now we can make really big graphs, right? So a 100-node graph, it's a hairball, right? So you wouldn't expect to be able to understand what's going on in this graph just by looking at it that way. So that's unfortunate. But the good thing is the computer can lay, this is like just like lay the points down randomly and hope it works out. Right? So there are smarter ways of doing that. So you can use draw circular, and then it lays out all the points on the graph as far away from each other as they can, and then just adds all the edges. This is called the bird's nest. Yes? <laughs> With real data. So, <laughs> so typically, so you're, you're operating at a few different scales, right? So small that graphs aren't useful, 
uh, small enough that visualizations are useful, and then large that visualizations are no longer useful. And so this is just pointing to the fact that the, the number of edges in your graph are more than you'd want to operate with uh, visually. And so you want to use the mathematical approaches to figure out um, different properties. And so this is where your adjacency matrix comes in. Now it's, it's in NumPy. And so doing operations on your adjacency matrix in NumPy is typically what you'd want to do when these visualizations don't work out. But so the other, and I don't think I yeah, play it here. So, so for instance, uh, here the layout, um, you're probably dense enough where the specific layout is not going to get you a big gain. But sometimes playing with different layouts of the graph actually does show the structure better. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You've not applied analytics or visualization, both? The network link analytics at all. OK. So how, and I, but I've seen all these visualizations. <laughs> I see like, yeah, there's, there's transactions, there's connected, there's that, but like, how do you apply that? Yeah, so, so a couple of answers. One is in a real, well, again, you get into the question of like, are you looking at a toy graph or a real graph? And I don't know how big your data is, so. Um, yeah, so this may not work out, but sometimes it does. So sometimes when you have a really big graph, what you're looking for is like a relationship between two communities. And so they're like, maybe I've got this like hair, like effectively what's a hairball, and you've got like all this like interconnectedness going on there, right? And like that's a mess. And then you've got this other graph over here, which is a different separate community of actors, and they're all talking to each other, right? But if these two communities aren't mostly talking to each other, and you can sort of see that like this guy talks to this guy and that guy talks to that guy. So like maybe if I can cluster up, this is a cluster and I've got another cluster here. And then what I probably care about is the edges between these two communities because those two communities talking to each other is unusual. But that's only if you've clustered out like this is a community and that's a community and this is the edges between them. So and then, but it's not always as pretty as this. So sometimes there's like, people won't talk to other communities. So like maybe this guy doesn't speak the same language as this person. And so like they really have an intermediary and this person can talk to those two different communities because they speak the same language, right? So like that, it gets a little bit messier. And so like typically you don't have as isolated as this. It's a you know higher distance connectivity to communities. But finding those types of things, if that's what you're looking for. Again, I don't know specifically in fraud detection what sort of outcomes you're seeking other than unusual behavior. And unusual. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and so I think you're actually in a little bit harder space because you're probably also looking at time series data. Yeah, so, so, so the great thing is all of the lecture tonight is on static graphs, right? So none of it accounts for the fact that these graphs are effectively evolving in time. That makes it way harder. So I feel your pain and. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll, off, I'll go off script a little bit more here and get myself in trouble maybe. But <laughs> So <clears throat> what you want to try and capture with a graph that's evolving through time is both those concepts, right? And so you'll have, like, uh, I've seen it done this way. So, like, think of a, so in phys I'm a physicist. I'll give that away right And So, like, basically I have some sort of, like, separation of people in this direction. So we'll call it x, and this is time. Right? And it's so like this person here is, they exist. And so since they exist, they're just going to be a straight line. right? And this guy, he's separate from this other guy. He also exists in time. right? And so then it becomes a question of, well, does it make more sense to lay out the graph as a set of, this guy talked to this guy at this time. And this guy talked to this guy at this time. right? And then these two guys talked. right? And so there's alternative ways of like representing your time series graph data. You still want to capture the fact that there's a relation between these two. And then your idea of like picking out what is a normal pattern of behavior sort of says like what is the shape of a communication pattern in this time series graph. And then you've got external and internal whether or not those communications are 
Right. So maybe, well, and we'll get to this in a little bit, but like you look at sort of like the weight of this edge, right? So like how much time did these two guys talk or on what channel did they talk, right? So like are they emailing each other or are they talking on the phone, right? Like, and I don't know exactly what insights on the fraud you have, like what data you're collecting, but that sort of informs what variables you'd want to put on here in the layout. All right. Anybody else have any like random questions? <laughs> Absolutely. Real world problems are always more exciting, right? Because they give you some like touch into like what's real. Yeah, yeah. But, but so they can't. They have to be somewhat correlated in the sense of you have like accounts or something. Um, so we could have the same IP address. Or a same bank account number. Okay. Or it's a number of different transactions on many different people's, you know, social security numbers that are all in the same session. Yeah, yeah. Session ID. So that's basically all the information we have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, but right. then what we look for is we look for like what is the sequence of transactions that they have with our servers mm -hmm. and to see if there's like a normal sequence. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, in a certain amount of time. And yep. then, yeah, so that's the problem. So, so, so this. So, so this is so, <laughs> not the interesting part, though. <laughs> uh, so, so to that point, so I made in my little time series graph here, I made the problem way easier because I said like this is a person, that's a person, that's a person. But what she's really saying is that maybe this is an IP address, and this is uh, what, what session a session ID, right? And then you have like another IP address, and like, and they're they're all talking to the server. So like, if your server is sitting up here, it's going to have like a lot of traffic to it, right? So like, all these IP addresses are talking to it at different times, right? And so this is going to be like a high, highly connected node in your graph. Um, and so then, um, I don't. So I don't have anything specific that I can pull out other than if you can group these different um, identifiers together, right? So like, if 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 you see that this IP and this session, I don't know how you can correlate any of those inputs or not. Like, is that available? Yeah. Okay. So, like, your social security number and your IP address. So, like, if I'm a normal user, right, I have a social security number, I'm coming from a computer which has an IP address. Therefore, a normal person can correlate that this IP address and the social security number are almost always seen together, right? So, if, so basically what I was hoping to aim for is like if you can sort of like group these together into they look sort of similar and that they're the same person, that would sort of make sense. So sort of, so I guess what I'm advocating for is like if you can identify what stories would be normal and then what patterns in your data would be associated with that story and then throw out all your normal data. Understanding of what normal behavior is. And then once we know more normal behavior, then we can identify anomalous behavior that doesn't necessarily fit the same mold of all the stuff we're doing. And the problem, so the problems, so April's problem is one of the worst because when you're looking, so let's say you were looking at market segmentation, which is slightly different, right? So market segmentation, you're trying to take a big population and divide it into smaller chunks. But if you're looking at fraud analysis, you're looking for highly unusual behavior. Right, so to look at, like, let's say I want to find an, a thousand examples of fraud. That means I'd have to look at, like, I don't know, a billion instances of normal behavior in order to find those 10,000. So because she's looking for really unusual behavior, she has to look at more data, right? Whereas if you were saying, I just want to put the population in half, it doesn't, like, you could have a relatively small data set to do that. But if you want a high number of anomalous events, they have to go through big data. So that's also what makes the problem hard. All right. So yes, this is a nest. <laughs> All right. Oh yeah. So just to say, like, uh, right. So <laughs> this is a, a random graph of a certain. How how many did I make? A hundred nodes. I think. Yeah, with 0.5 probability being connected or something. And so the fun things you can ask in this graph are like. 
how big is the graph? And, and so data characterization is a very important problem because if I say that I have uh, a certain problem size, that's not very descriptive. So let's say I have a thousand, <laughs> a thousand nodes in my graph and a hundred edges. Well, like I don't actually know what that graph looks like, right? So you know you need to have better ways of characterizing whether these thousand nodes with a hundred edges is equivalent or comparable to another graph of also a thousand nodes and hundred edges. And so having good ways of comparing whether two graphs are the same is important to, to make that comparison. And so one way of doing that is to look at uh, the all pairs shortest path length in your graph. And so this is saying like for every node in my graph and for every other node in my graph, how do I get between those two nodes, right? I want to follow, okay, I erased it. So if I have like A and B and C and D and I have a graph that looks like this, then, and I want to ask, what's the distance between A and B? Well, it's one. Right, there's one edge. What's the difference between A and C? Two, right? So that distance is two. What's the difference between A and D? One, all right? So now we've done all the pairs for A. Now we're gonna do them for B, right? B to A, one, B to C, three, B to D, two, right? So doing all that. So then you wanna look at all the pairs and you wanna figure out what is the shortest path, path length for all pairs. And so that's one way of characterizing the size of your graph. And so for the graph that I drew, which is fully connected with 100 nodes, and it looks like a mess, right? Every graph, uh, sorry, every, the maximum, uh, the maximum path length, all, right, I said, all pairs shortest length. Yeah, maximum path is six, uh, six edges. And so that's the, how far you'd have to go at most to get across the entire graph from any pair. So that happens to have a same uh, feature as the human population. So who, yeah, who here has heard of Kevin Bacon and six degrees of separation? Nobody. All right. So there's a movie actor. His name is Kevin Bacon. He's in movies. And so <laughs> there's a game called the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. And so the challenge is how do you get from any person to Kevin Bacon using all known relationships of humans? And it turns out the answer is you'll always be able to get to this one person within six edges. So six relationships. Any one of you are related to Kevin Bacon by no more than six relationships. Has a relationship with? Has a relationship. Yeah, so there's like five people between you and Kevin Bacon in terms of relations. Yeah, that one I don't have. We can. <laughs> I don't. But you can do a Google search after class. But <laughs> so the point is, it's a way of measuring, like there's like, what, 7 billion people on Earth, right? And so that's one way of measuring how large the population is. But then if you're like, how closely linked are we? That's a way of measuring the connectivity of all the relationships. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Same thing. Yeah. And so I don't have a... I, to your question, like, what is the definition of relationship in this case? I don't have an answer for that, but sorry. Uh, so this is how Facebook, by the way, makes your, your, your recommendations. So you may know someone, and they may know someone, and so typically Facebook is likely to recommend people who are geographically close to you and have a relationship that's in one or two hops. They're called hops sometimes. All right, so that's all Network X. So another cool thing in Network X, if I'm giving a tour here, there are different like shapes of graphs. So the lollipop graph, what does that look like? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> my apologies. <laughs> All right. So so the point is, you're like working with random graphs. You almost never in in real life have a graph, right? You almost always have a, ran, a a graph that appears random at first glance, but then there's some patterns in it. That's why graphs are interesting, right? And so typically, in order to build, like, if you don't have, so this gets back to data access, right? Typically, you won't have access. If I walked up to the Social Security Administration and asked, "Can you give me all your fraud data?" They'd say, "No," right? Like that's a pretty easy answer. And so then the question becomes, well, how, as I, a data scientist researcher, how do I gain skill in graph analysis. 
Well, the fun thing is you can build graphs, like you can take a random graph and combine that with like a lollipop graph, and then see, can I detect the lollipop graph within the random graph? All right, so like you can mix and match different graph patterns overlaying your data and then see if you can figure out where they are. So then the question becomes for the lollipop graph, like what features would you have to figure out exist in that graph for you to detect it, right? So we'd have to find a set of nodes that are all fully connected. And then one of those nodes is connected to a bunch of other nodes and none of those other nodes are connected to the highly connected graph, right? So picking out known patterns and then being able to find them in your, uh, in your messy graph, that's like a skill, right? So Identify, like when, when April was saying machine learning, what you're really doing is you're saying, these are a bunch of fraud, like if the lollipop graph was your fraud pattern of behavior, right? Yeah, look for other things like this. So you train your machine learning engine to say, these are the features I care about in my machine learning algorithm. Um, as, this would be for supervised, right? And then and you'd say, look through my messy graph of a bunch of billions of data points and see if you see anything that looks sort of like a lollipop graph. Right. So not all fraud behavior is going to look exactly like something like this, right? It's going to have all the exact same features. So then you're looking for close approximation matches. But if you get too many of those, that's also a problem. So, all right, all right, <laughs> all right. So this is basically a little tour of Network X. Any questions on that? Be pretty straightforward. Right, so here's there's a Wikipedia page you can look it up and see what their answer is. <laughs> All right, so so far we've totally focused on directed graphs, and that's like most of uh, that's not most graphs. So we're gonna cruise on to uh, more interesting graphs. So often you'll see what I call directed graphs, and so then we're basically adding a feature. We have nodes, edges, and those edges have directionality. And so you can have a mixture of maybe you have an edge where that goes back and forth. So like I as person J know person K and K knows me. So therefore we're going in both directions. Whereas like maybe M is famous and F knows F, F knows M, but M has no idea who F is, right? How many are in a really, how many of you are in a relationship like that, right? I know this person, but they have no idea who I am. <laughs> All right. So let's look at some applications of a directed graph. All right. All right. So pi call graph. Um, the utility here is uh, pretty handy. You'll be deployed out into the real world, and you'll look at some Python code, and you'll say, "What the fuck is going on?" All right. That's like a standard question. The first time someone hands you code, you have no idea what's doing. So <laughs> there's a pretty handy function called pi call graph. All right, so I've got a function here. Let's see. So a call function that calls print me, and then the print me function, what does that do? It prints hello world, and then there's this other function nice, which does nothing and takes a couple arguments. Right. So so this is like a you know reasonably complicated program. It's got functions, functions that call other functions. So let's take a look at what that looks like visually. All right. So we've got my main program that's like my cell in this notebook. And then I start out by calling a cool function. And then that function calls print me and nice. All right, so now we have a nice visualization of what the call graph of that program was. So this gets pretty handy because like most, func most programs in Python are not as small as these three functions, right? They'll have hundreds of functions and you have no idea what's going on. And so this is a nice sort of visual tour of the application as it runs. And they call, they include how many times it was called and the duration of that execution. So maybe you can figure out where the hot spot in your program is. Like where is most time being spent? It's in this function. I'm gonna spend most of my attention analyzing this function. <laughs> Go ahead. On Python code, you can run my uh, pi call graph against it. All right, <laughs> score two for one. Okay, I think that's it. It's so here I've demonstrated using it in the code, but you can have unmodified code that you run pi call graph against. <laughs> Sorry. 
Ah, so so right. So I I, I import my libraries, and then I say with pi call graph, and it's got a bunch of functions in it, and I call it. And then so what I'm using is so because I'm in Jupyter, the PNG that is created by pi call graph, I want to show it in the notebook. So this code right here has nothing to do with pi call graph. This code is just showing there's a PNG on disk. Show it in the notebook. Good question. All right, so that's one handy use of directed graphs. Let's look at another because this is one. This one is like one of my favorites. Like it's if all right. So <laughs> everybody likes glob. So so I've got a, a set of files and folders, and I want to use glob to look at all that. Right. So what do I get back? This huge list of files, right? Nobody likes reading that, especially. So suppose I were to run this program in the in the C directory of my computer, I'd get tens of thousands of files back, right? And that list would be just hard to read. And if I wanted to know what was on my computer, I'd have to read through that list out of every single file. I don't do that as a data scientist, right? I'm lazy. So what do we do? Got this huge long list, and we'll go through. And well, this is making it a little bit more fancy. So there's folders. We'll come back to that if you need, but so basically, <coughs> I can take that same uh, that that same graph that we started out with with the Sir Belvedere and all that other stuff, and we can put, we can replace it with a set of folders and files, right? So it's the same sort of idea of a relationship, but now instead of the relationship between people, we're going to have a folder that contains these files, and a folder can contain other folders. And that folder contain folders, right? And so that same idea of like people knowing people, we're gonna have folders and files. So you can convert files and folders into relationships and make a graph. <laughs> right, exactly. That was the right response. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So instead of people, we have folders. All right. So I'm gonna get to the cut to the cut cut to the chase here. It's first pass here, it sort of sucks. I'll, I'll admit. So because I have all these folders and files, right? So dot is like the, the directory I'm in. And then it's got all these different files and folders, right? And it is straight up a mess. You've got this. Huh? No, 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 no. Dot, well, it, on your computer, dot has a special connotation that it is the folder you're in. So um, all these other dots, those are just a separation between the name and the extension. So. This is saying that in the current directory, I have a file called samplefile.txt. I also have print files. So let's see if I can find a thing like that looks like a folder. Mm, no, I'm way over here. Yeah, there we go. So I have a thing called folder, which is IPYMB checkpoints that has some other files in it. So you can tell that this is doing the right thing. It's got files and folders. But you can also tell that visually, it's just hard to read. So I'm going to flip the view. So change it from the default to a left-right orientation. That's what this LR is doing. And now when I re I print the same graph, basically, and now it looks much more readable. Okay. So this is going to reiterate the point. The layout of your graph improves interpretability if you play around with it. But graph is doesn't have any, like, it's not smart. It doesn't know what you want. And so you have to play with it to figure out what representation is more understandable. Huh? Mm, I'm not. What, what is your question? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So, well, it'd take a little bit of tuning, but I think I'll, I'll draw out what I think you mean, and you can tell me if I'm right or not. So you'd have, like, computer, and then you'd have, like, a drive A, and drive C, and drive D, and then within there maybe you have, like, a folder called Windows. Is that what you mean? So you're just changing what the top level node is in your directed graph. I think that's what is that what you're asking? So uh, your diagram is not improving the time. 
Yeah, correct. I'm I'm starting from the directory that I'm in and looking. I'm not looking from the computer down. So I'm just so yeah. So I skipped over a bunch of code to get to the punchline. If I go back a little bit, basically I'm saying from the current directory, look at all the all the files and folders that are below this level, and it's looking lower in the hierarchy. So, but you could run this script from anywhere. It would just create a huge stuff that probably wouldn't too, be too readable. On what? Well, so so he's asking, does this run in the zip file or open the zip file? Right, that's the question. So all I did right here, <coughs> this code. I'm looking for files and folders. So if you wanted to ask what are the file contents of all my zip files, you would have to include Python code that runs the unzip-l command to see what's in your zip files. Certainly reasonable. It'd just be an extra line here of if this file is a zip, then run this command to see what's in the zip. Yeah, totally reasonable. But that's the cool thing about like we're basically using Python to construct this graph. So now anything you can do in Python, like look at the number of files in my zip file, is something you can include in your graph. Here? Yeah. I'm, so I have a, uh, a string. The string is called, the variable is called deer path, and that variable deer path contains a string, which is the, the path of the folder. Okay. And then I'm appending that string to a string that says slash. And this is basically giving the path to the folder, yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> so we looked at something that I would consider pretty intuitive, of like having this left to right orientation of the graph, pretty readable. That's not the only one, right? So like, Circo, which is just another layout engine for your graph, it makes little circles, right? So like, I would claim this is less readable, but it's pretty, right? I mean, like you can certainly look at it, but whether this one's more or less relevant. This might go back to April's concern where we had like different communities laid out and you wanted to find the connectivity between those. Maybe a circle graph would be a good one for that. Right. Again, it depends on your data set, your application, and what you're looking for in the relationships. Okay, and then, yeah. So then there's like compromise. This is what I call a compromise. So it kind of takes your space that you're laying out the graph in and tries to optimize the separation between all the nodes. So that layout is called Neato. And this is a pretty standard layout that people will use because it is generically applicable. You just want the most separation between everything. That's what Neato tries to accomplish. And then that makes it huge, but pretty well spaced out. So all right. I think that's it for this one. Yeah. So yeah. So, so the, how do you save these in Python? So there's a couple responses to that. One is um, the code to create the PNG file. That's that one. Once the PNG file is created, then I'm telling Jupyter, open up that PNG and show it in Jupyter. So the PNG file already exists in the directory. Yeah, that's, that's what we're seeing, basically. The other question is, well, I don't want to carry around a bunch of PNG files. I just want the source code for the graph, right? And that's that dot file. So if you type fld.source, that produces the source code that produces the graph. And that, that source code is independent of the layout, remember? So like, what are the nodes and edges? That's what the source code contains in, in the dot language. But the, the PNG is a specific rendering of that graph. Yes. So that that's so that so if you're trying to save a bar chart, that is a separate command because you're there using matplotlib. So that's just like plot or plt dot save fig, different command, but same capability. Okay. Huh? What? To 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 know what syntax we use in order to save this page from a certain library. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> you read my Google. Yes. <laughs> Man, you're learning. All right. All right. It is past our bedtime, so let's take a break. Uh, it's 8:50. We'll come back. Sorry.
to the translation. So let's put it at 8.02. I know, well, depends on you looking at that clock. Yeah. Outcome of the hypothesis. What, like, what is the outcome you are expecting? Yes. Yeah. Like, uh, this is my hypothesis. Like, I told the some uh, column, like, some of the value in the column is greater than this one. Okay. Uh, that is my hypothesis. So, how do I prove that? Like, should I prove that, or should I like uh, come to some conclusion? Mm, what would I'm not sure what the difference is there. What's the difference? So, like, if A is greater than B, yeah, that is my hypothesis. First, okay. To yeah. See by seeing the data. Yes. So after working on that, should I prove this, or should I uh, uh, tell like, should I prove that? Or yeah. Not? He's asking that to be true, or it can be anything true or false. It could be true or false. Okay. Yeah. So the goal isn't to say I'm only going to come up with true hypotheses. Like that would be boring because those are not exciting. But if you can say I think this is going to happen. And then the, the really interesting part is if the answer is no. Because if the answer is no, there's two causes, right? Either I didn't understand what was going on, or the data is wrong. Uh, like, uh, I need to uh, show that using visualization. Not necessarily. It could be some sort of data analysis. I mean, like, it could be a data, it could be a visualization, but that's not the only way of going about validating a hypothesis. Question? Okay. So this is my data. Uh huh. Uh, this is a housing permit stimulation of the Okay. So, uh, what could be my hypothesis? What I thought was. Mm -hmm. So, date of sure is there. Okay. Uh, this is a column. So, what I thought was in the 2000, in the year 2018, uh, there were the maximum number of cases registered for demolition. Okay. Is that the right way of hypothesis? So comp comp maximum compared to what? Okay. Uh, it has to be with respect. Like, you know, <laughs> if you just have a number, that's a number. So in this year, okay. the more number of cases registered in the year 2018. Compared to the year 2017. Okay, that that's a statement. But, uh, so, what is? Do you have a reason for that, or something more? Like, like that could be. So, let's say that was true. Let's say it was false. It does like it doesn't gain you anything, right? But what is? What would you like? Is there a reason that you'd expect that to be the case? Okay. So let's. What are the other columns you've got? So here, okay, maybe here's I bought. How many years of data is there? Is it like 2019 only, or is it? No, uh, we have around five years. Five years. Okay. So you could say, um, and this is the number of demolitions. Yeah. Is that correct? So do you think there are more in the winter or the summer? Okay. So in terms of months. Well, you have the data. <laughs> Right, so like maybe some may, is there some seasonality? We'd expect seasonality, right? Yeah. So every year, okay. right? We could look at the count and you'd say. Uh, so during the windows, at the time there will be more demolitions. More demolitions when? And Why is that? Snowfall. Snowfall does not demol demolish a house. Yeah.
Right, so so <laughs> snow doesn't snow doesn't put in a permit for a demolition. <laughs> But if I were a construction worker, right, like this is the part where you have to sort of be creative, right? If I were a construction worker, would it be more likely that I'd want to do the work in the summer or the winter, right? Like that's a question you can ask. If you were a construction worker, when would you want to demolish a house? Okay. So so you think, this is I'm, I'm trying to capture what you're saying, that there is some seasonality and that there's more demolitions in the summer than there are in the winter. Uh, on a yearly basis, is that a is that a good summary? Okay. Mm -hmm. so can I be in which in which neighborhood? Okay. How about let's look at cost. So, what is cost? Cost estimate. Cost estimation for the construction. <laughs> for the demolition, you mean? So would you expect there to be more demolitions of cheap houses or expensive houses? Like the cost the cost of the demolition of a large house is going to be higher than the cost of a demolition of a small house, right? So would you expect in Baltimore are there more large houses or small houses? Okay. So then would you expect there to be a lower cost? Okay. Can we be more quantitative like what that ratio is, so we can say like twice as many, ten percent more, like. So how do I have to take that? I'm not sure. <laughs> how to take the number. What does take the number mean? Uh, twice, so uh, have you been in Have you been in Baltimore? No. You have not been in Baltimore. Yeah, this is just three months. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that that's. So one of the reasons that I, I can't even estimate how the cost is <laughs> okay, that's fine. So so we have no familiarity with the data basically. <laughs> okay. Mm, what are the other columns? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd say I'd recommend uh, looking at the data. And the cost; those are the things that you can probably make a guess about. But basically, it's making an estimation of what you think should happen and being quantitative. So, I'm gonna get back to class. Yeah. <laughs> Do what? Sure. Well, you're certainly welcome to use like Blackboard Collaborate to remote in, but you wouldn't get attendance credit. <laughs> That's the trade off. All right. Somehow everyone disappeared. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to get started without everybody. That's their problem, not mine. <laughs> All right. <coughs> so maybe you've heard of this website called Google. It's pretty popular, right? <laughs> so it, they make their business out of analyzing the internet as a graph. Okay, okay so the internet is a graph. Can anyone explain why that is? <laughs> right. Well, so the couple couple answers that are valid. One is it's physically a network that's connected with wires. That's a true statement. But also, websites have links. And so if I go to a web page <laughs> like umbc.edu, it has a bunch of links. And you can think of that link as going to another page being a directed graph. So hopefully I just blew your mind. The internet is a directed graph. Can you imagine how big that graph is? It's so big that Google has many, many data centers dedicated to understanding that graph. Right? That's what Google does. It's a huge directed graph that Google has to analyze to tell you which sites are important for your search. 
right? That's all that Google does. So they have this fancy algorithm called PageRank, which you'll hopefully understand a little bit better, but there's basically links and you have to figure out which pages are popular based on this PageRank algorithm. So Google does not analyze their data visually, right? They have math that does it. All right, so I'm not claiming that you're Google, but you could be like Google. And you have the tools, right? We showed you in the, I think, lecture three, W, Git, Curl, and Scrapey. And so you could build a, a directed graph of a set of web pages. Now, you can't scrape just on the old web page, hopefully legally, but um, there are a couple of websites. As a reminder, these websites exist. They have links on them. And so if you use W, Git, and scrape these different websites, <coughs> you could build a directed graph of a web page. That's super cool. Right? So you could run page rank against a set of web pages and understand much better what Google does. All right, so I'm not saying you're all going to go work for Google, but it's sort of a fun exercise if you're bored. <laughs> all right. All right, so this is getting back towards uh, the question of, like, um, what are these ones and zeros doing here? All right, so we can use these ones and zero representation of a directed graph. So now let's look at F and M. I'm going to use the source node on the left-hand side. This is just a convention that I made up, right? so conventions vary. The destination node is going to be on top. And so F goes to M, means there's a 1 there. But then between, let's look at uh, from M to F, there's nothing. Right? So this is how we're representing that directed graph using an adjacency matrix. So what we lose here is that diagonal symmetry. Right? So we no longer can it. So like between J and K, there are symmetric ones because the graph goes in both directions. But that's the only place that exists. All right. So not too surprising. This is number quiz two and three of four. So let's see. Um, does anyone have any observations on what they think the hidden value is between? Uh, I, uh, the left is source. I think. Well, you could actually, you could you could figure out where that is. Uh, let's see. Zero. Okay. So you, yeah, if you wanted to ask like what, which one is source, which one is the node, so you look at two and five. So between two and five, there's a zero in this direction, and two and five in this direction is a one. So that means the bottom here, this is the source, and this is the destination. So once you know that, then you can figure out what the value is there. Zero. Yeah. Okay. Nothing goes to one. All right, same question. <laughs> All right, so between three and zero, right? That's where we're looking. And the options are either, uh, so three to one. There is an edge, that's important. So which one is it? So we look at the other one. Here, there's already an edge, and we know this is a directed graph, so this should be a zero. Oh, oh sorry, my bad. How did I get that wrong? From one to three. Oh yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. I was looking at zero. My bad. <laughs> Nobody corrected me that I was looking at the wrong node. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. I think this is our second to last activity. So, so far, I've been influencing you a lot to try and build connections with your peers. But that's not the only way that your social network works. Right? So there are people who are more important than you, and you typically don't get a lot of exposure time with them. So it becomes important. Like, if you're just going to talk with your peers, you don't have to like think ahead, oh, what am I going to say this tonight? You don't have to think about it, right? But sometimes you do want to think ahead about an interaction. Especially with this, if it's with people who are important, are super busy, and you don't often see. Right? So those are typically your leadership. All right. So <laughs> there's a problem that leaders have. Right? They have like there's the top level leaders, then they have people who report to them, and another set of managers who report to them, and you at the very bottom. You know. And so the problem is, the leaders typically don't actually know what their organization is doing, because they only get the good news. Right? Good news filters up. Bad news does not. That's a problem for leadership, right? They're flying blind, basically. But they can't go down. They can't, like, they can't jump over all those different layers of managers to talk to you directly. 
because that would appear as micromanaging. And so they're caught in this conundrum of they don't know what their organization is doing, but they can't be seen talking to anybody because that would be bad form. <laughs> so then you have leadership who just does not know what's going on. All right. So then you can think ahead, well, um, what are you typically going to complain to a leadership about, right? You're going to say, I don't have enough whatever, right? Or everything is going great, or I know that thing that you need, I'm going to do it, right? Like those are the things that they typically hear. So I, the way I operate, this is just, you don't have to adopt this behavior. I don't do any of those things, right? <laughs> is it, yeah, so I try and surprise people. <laughs> and that's either with good news or bad news, right? Good news always filters up, remember. So I typically can't beat the good news because they've already heard it. But I can tell them things that they don't want to hear. And typically, they actually find value from that, right? When you tell leadership something that they have not heard before, it's bad news and it's ground truth, they eat that up, right? They want that. And so the, the trick is, can you find something that they have not heard before, right? And that they could make a decision and change their behavior based upon, right? So these are the things worth thinking about so that when you randomly run into your leadership in the hallway or in an elevator, right, then you have something to say to them that they leave in with an impression, oh, wow, that person, I remember them. And they gave me this interesting news that wasn't good news, right? But it was something that I learned from and I, and I really needed to know. So these are the sort of things to like think ahead about because you're typically not going to be able to come up with that on the fly. Now you have to think ahead a little bit about like who would I typically see that's important and it would have influence over the entire organization, but I want to have a quick story that's important, right? So that, that's how I operate. That's not how most people operate. <laughs> I'm not saying that you should operate that way. It's a highly risky business, right? Because like if you tell something, something that someone does not want to hear, their opportunity is to fire you, right? That's, that's a thing. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, it sounds like a complaint. All right. So we're gonna form groups of three. So let's see. That would be twenty. Let's see. Eight. Yes. All right. So we're gonna <laughs> one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the eight group is going to have two people. All right, find your group. Okay, yeah. All right, so you've got your groups of three. <laughs> so there's this guy. Has anyone met this guy personally yet? Who said yes? Somebody said yes. We had a yes? No? Okay, so Freeman Harbowski, he's like an important person at UMBC because he's the president of UMBC. He actually works on campus, right? Like, surprise, surprise. And you're on campus. Oh, that means you could have run into him, right? So if you ran into him, like one option would be to ignore him. That's what most people probably do, right? Or they don't recognize him. That's cool. Um, or you say like hi, and he'd say hi, right? That's a low-value interaction. At best, it distracts him. Or you could say something, right? A value, right? And so this is the part where you get to think ahead. All right, I think that was it. Yeah. Uh, sorry, it's stuck there. So the goal here is, um, what are you, you know, what are you going to develop your pitch for? So not to say that you have to present some problem in a solution or like, you know, what would you say if you met him on the UMBC campus, right? So that's what your group of three is going to talk about. I'll give you a few minutes to talk about that. What are you going to say to your leadership, right? We're treating this as the corporation. This is the CEO. You're a worker. What are you going to do? 
Do you have anything that you want to say to Freeman Arbowski? If I get a chance, maybe I would start off with uh, saying about my experience. To, you know, the, uh, as he's the president of UMBC, so I'll start with uh, my experience in UMBC. Okay. So this is the first time I've uh, come out of my motherland, home country. So I would talk about my experience and then maybe I'll start talking about data science, my course, and what I've learned. And, uh, okay. Yeah, that is what I will talk about. Maybe so, I can try introducing my friend, asking the problems I'm facing in the subject, or maybe like asking for advice from him. Is he a data scientist? But I no. Can ask, like, I can ask about networking or anything. How do I like coming from a different place? I can ask like, how do I approach for internships? Okay, so like mentorship. Yeah. Okay. So. It, that way, I can ask for assisting. So I can meet him personally. Just I think that's develop, so, the develop the connection, maybe. But the likelihood that you're not gonna see him again, like he's pretty busy. So this is like a one-time interaction, right? Like, if you see him, the goal isn't to set up like a meeting, right? Oh yeah, I can just <laughs> tell him like this is my problem. Can you give me advice in like two minutes? What would you, what problem would you present? <laughs> yeah, that is something I didn't think of. That was like one thing I had in mind. Can I talk about the problems we face in UMBC with professors or something? Absolutely. He, he would he want to hear about that? Yes. All right. Sure. Yeah. So that, try that. So 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 would you would you just complain or would you try and say like what no, no, you know? Like this is a problem I'm trying to face. Is there any? any is there any way I can um, not complain exactly? Maybe like I can say this is the problem I'm facing. Is there any? Can you give a solution for it? This is what I'm thinking. I can. Th I think I can approach the problem this way. Maybe I can try that. Okay. So anything specific or just? No, it's just a random thought I got. I'm just like collecting my thoughts yeah, and yeah. presenting it at this point of time. What would you suggest? <laughs> Well, as an instructor, my complaints would be very different than yours. So. Yeah, we would love to hear that. <laughs> the department, UMBC is simply trying to make money in the data science department. Uh, well, yes. So. <laughs> we pay thirteen hundred for credit. <laughs> it's it's very difficult. Uh, I don't know. As an instructor, that's a little frustrating because the focus isn't on the quality of instruction. It's on trying to process as many students as quickly as possible. So I get UMBC has to make money or else it goes out of business. So I get the dilemma, but and I don't have a solution for it. Okay, the problem I'm, I'm trying to face is that one of the major problems data scientists say is that we don't have any professors on the campus or we don't have office hours. Maybe you come, but there are other professors who don't generally come. Sure. So that is one of the problems. And most of the pro other issues is that generally the professors are in the campus. A lot of uh, students can get to know about the research projects we're working, but we don't get to do that. Way sure. Because a professor is, from, uh, is working already, so you don't get to like do an assistant or you know try doing something which you have which you're interested in right yeah and that is one of the problem i actually faced over here yeah. and like a lot of students generally in masters are confused on what they want to do and i think you don't have like a proper a professor where who talks about it you know this is what you want because we are facing that problem now we don't know what we want to choose for the next semester mm -hmm. It's not just about the next semester. Even in data science, there are different uh, streams which we can go in. So we, we also need guidance in, you know, according to which, uh, you know, uh, we have our own area of interest, but we're not sure if that is the one we need to approach. Or, you know, there are a lot of confusions. In Absolutely. Yeah, and we don't have much seniors also to con like contact. You know, the people who have studied, the students who have studied before, we hardly have very less seniors in this program. Yeah. So it's getting increasingly very difficult to, you know, contact, you know, how does internships work. We have a lot of complaints. <laughs> <laughs> and we just realized it. <laughs> All right, let's take another 30 seconds. Thank you. Uh, you can stay here because we're going to do another activity after this. So, but I'll be back. Thank <laughs> you.
Okay, so the last section of this activity. What we're going to work on is actually doing it. So um, can I ask for a, a volunteer to play act this scene? <laughs> it's very quick. So you're, you're, you're on the main boulevard of UMBC, right? You have roughly 30 seconds to a minute to talk to someone. So. <laughs> I'm going to play the role of Freemowski. Right? <laughs> I'm walking. I'm walking from from ITE to the library, so I'm I'm walking in the same direction as you. Hi, what's your name? Hi, I'm Atil. Atil. Hi, Mr. Nebraska. It's a nice meeting you. All right. How's it going today? Yeah, I'm I'm doing data science uh, at UMBC, so it's a professional program here. Okay. Uh, it's yeah. Been going good. I'm it's very new. Data, yeah. So I'm trying to solve some real life data scientists. That's very good. Yeah. So one thing uh, regarding this program, it's a professional course. I agree with that. But uh, we do not have a specific department on campus. So I felt uh, we should have a specific department that has faculty staying on campus to approach them and have some funding for research. So yeah. So the the data science department is a uh, under the computer science umbrella, and we are trying to stand up the data science department. So I will take that into consideration. Thank you. All right, so that's typically your interactions are going to be short because they're on their way to something else and they're not expecting to meet with you. So you have to have a pitch that's pretty quick. That was very good. Um, so he maintained eye contact. He was pretty. He wasn't sort of like dancey, right? Like you can get you can get nervous, right? You start stammering. You do things you wouldn't normally do when interacting with a peer. And so it's good to sort of have an idea of like what this interaction is going to be like. There's a huge potential, right? It's highly risky for you. To them, it's at best an annoyance, right? And so, like, trying to bridge that is the challenge. All right, thank you. All right, so for our, our last little content section, this is the most likely um, set of information you'll probably run across. So what we've covered so far is undirected graphs and directed graphs. Those are cool, and they're like, cool to think about, but they're not what you'll probably run into most of the time. So I'm going to go through a couple different use cases. The first one here that is for a weighted graph is the idea of like logistics, basically. You have something that's going to physically go to somewhere else. What does that mean? It means that the distance traveled between two different locations, where the locations are your nodes, those distances are going to be different. And so the amount of energy or resources you're spending and getting from one place to another is different. right? So if I'm driving from Baltimore to Chicago versus Baltimore to DC versus Baltimore to Philadelphia, those are different distances. And so we can treat the graph as a set of weighted edges as, our, as my logistics transportation. That was not connected? Is a question? OK. OK. So, so the idea is that you have a physical resource, and you can describe the connectivity between physical locations as a weighted graph, where the weights are typically the resources you're spending on the relationship. And then typically you're asking a math question of like, I want to optimize something in that set of resources, whether it's the speed or cost. All right, so here's a typical sort of like data set that you would be presented. Right? Don't try to read this, but basically this is a different set of locations. They're all in Texas. This is the same set of locations, also in Texas. And so it's giving you the distance in miles between each one of those pairs. And so if you were responsible for sending a truck to Austin and Dallas and El Paso, a really straightforward question is, what route should I take? And in which order should I visit the cities? Right? This is like a standard graph question. And so you're trying to minimize the time that it takes 
right? Because um, you know, typically your routes are pretty complicated, and so you have to get between all these different cities and not spend too much gas. Okay. So here's a slightly cooler example, in my opinion. Uh, hopefully, everyone has either used Apple or Google Maps. Right? And this is an actual problem that is really hard to solve. Right? So you pick some random place where you are, and you pick some other place that is on the map. Right? And then you ask Google, what's the fastest way to get there? Right? And <laughs> think of all the different permutations that Google could go through. Right? Google could get from here to there, and then over to there, and then over to there. Right. Oh, and then also let's layer on traffic, right? Because traffic is dynamic. That makes the problem harder. Let's do that, right? All of this makes it more useful, but it's way more mathematically harder, right? So <laughs> the cool thing, so like here I've captured the fact that Google is looking at a bunch of different routes and it's giving you what the best option is given a transportation mode, right? Because public transportation is different from public transportation, right? And there's all these different factors. So how does Google do this? There's a lot of permutations in the different routes it could take. And if you try and do from like, let's say like New York to Los Angeles, it's super fast, right? How does it do it so fast? Because it, it can't pre-calculate all possible combinations of that route. So the trick that Google uses is it takes your route and it segments it into chunks. And so it says like, let's take you from New York to uh, Virginia, and then like from Virginia to St. Louis, and from St. Louis to there, right? And so it's doing this sort of like fractal pattern of let's look at a large area and figure out the best route to get out of that area. And we're going to connect you to the next area. And then within that, we'll do a little route finding algorithm. Right? So it's not actually finding every single path on every single point. It's doing them in chunks. And that improves the parallelism and decreases the number of routes it has to explore. And then just connect all those different options into this. Hmm? Sure. <laughs> yeah, but it's basically chunking the graph into a bunch of smaller problems and then solving them. Hmm? <laughs> that I don't. <laughs> I do not know how big the chunks are. That's an optimization problem for Google to solve. Uh, so if you're so. And I'm not saying I'm not providing the solution that Google uses, but I'm going to provide you a pretty quick solution. So let's say I'm going from New York. Okay, I'm sorry, I just changed my question. Yeah. How can they decide the size of chunks? That's what yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's a different question. All right. So, so Google has a bunch of data. They hire almost all the data scientists, right? So, how would I do it? I'm going to draw a circle around New York and a circle around Los Angeles. And I'm going to draw another circle around New York and another circle around Los Angeles, right? And I'm going to look at these different sized circles until they intersect. And then I'm going to find like, like where are all these intersections. That'll sort of define my chunks. But your question is, how do I draw how big the circles are? Yeah. 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 And so that's, again, an optimization problem. You could just choose a bunch of different sizes and see which ones provide you the fastest. So I don't know exactly what the answer is, but it's just sort of like playing around with these different parameters to tune them to find a good outcome. Because they're trying to minimize both how much work their computers have to do and how long you have to wait for it. So the goal of like what they're trying to optimize for is very clear. But how they, how, what specifically the outcome of this tuning was, I don't know. But does that make sense? So you're looking basically for like, where's all the intersecting area? That's the place where you're probably going to have to look for like these different hops, right? Okay. I mean, it's highly like it's highly unlikely that the optimal route is going to be over here, right? It's more likely going to be a straight shot. So you just look for these intersections. Okay. Good questions. All right, and there. <laughs> so the the specific article is linked, and it probably provides better detail than I will, but it's there and available. All right, so there's uh, different ways to think about this. So now we're going to deviate from the idea of a zero and one identification for your nodes and edges. So here I've made the choice that I'm going to still stick with integers, but there's no reason you have to do that, right? You could have values between zero and one, or you could stick with unbounded integers. Like, however you want to weight your graph, that's fine. So it's just the choice you get to make. Here I've sort of correlated 
the visual density of the line with the weight of the graph. Again, that's just sort of like a, a visual nice to have, not a requirement. Okay. I think in the interest of time, we'll skip over the, oops, not the wrong one. Oh yeah, sorry. <coughs> so we already talked about logistics. Let's talk about dating, right? Because dating is fun. So what I care about when I'm dating someone is do they have any shared interest? If the answer is no, then I probably have less interest in dating them, right? And so one way of saying like, are, is, there, is there a shared interest, right? Like maybe this person is interested in that person, so there's a direction, and their shared interest in a given topic is ranked, right, between like zero and one, right? And then like this person likes that person, and their shared interest level is 0.4. Right. Well, so like I, this person likes cars, and this person likes cars, right? And a level of I don't. Know. Right. So the amount. <laughs> this person is interested in that person, but maybe that person has no interest in that person. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a very sad social network. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think, I think you guys are pointing to the fact that you'd want some sort of directionality back in this way, right? Yeah, that's also cool. But typically, those won't be the same weights, right? Like, the level of interest one person has in another won't be the same as that person having in the original, right? So, okay, so that's one way of sort of characterizing, because, like, basically, you have, think of it as a pandas data frame, right? You have this huge list of names, and then you have, like, what is this person like? and maybe a list of all the people they like, that's just a really hard thing to reason about. But potentially thinking of it as a graph and the relations, like this person likes a bunch of people that are easy to like figure out pairs for, right? This person is very poorly connected with other people. You're gonna have a harder time. So can I say as a data scientist, if you're single, yeah. you can create a algorithm to search for someone. Absolutely. So, <laughs> I, I won't, I, I'll not do it right now, but if you Google for like data science and dating, there's a bunch of articles on like strange individuals who have done exactly that, right? So, so you have wget, curl, and scrapey, and if you have a login for a website, let's say match.com, okcupid, Tony Fish, like whatever the dating websites are, you have the tools of a data scientist to find that person, right, much more efficiently than trying to click around. And there have been many people who have done this, not, let's say, more than a hundred, let's say, right? By yes. So there's so whenever these people like get profiled by a newspaper, they get in the article. Now you can search for them. So like, so so definitely that's a, a thing that people do. They're typically weird, and they have some notoriety. Uh, like, so being a data scientist, you can solve like the relationship problem. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> 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 all right. All right. So I've advertised pretty heavily the idea of graphs. Um, there's lots of little caveats that will trip you up in your in your activities. So these are we're thinking about. All right. And I think I don't quite have enough. So I'm sort of on this edge of like I don't have enough time to talk about this activity or the next content. So I'm going to try and touch a little bit on both. And then we'll slip this activity into the end of the semester. <laughs> Homework, I think. Well, OK. So there's a website, Los Alamos National Laboratory. So in the United States, there's a bunch of things called national labs. There were all the scientists hang out. Um, and so Los Alamos National Laboratory, they have a bunch of computers at their company. And so they have these computers that are connected with physical cables, and the computers talk to each other. Sounds like a network, right? All right. So let's, I'm not going to have this as an activity, but what I wanted to get across was the fact that this is actually a big data set. So I'm going to pull open this data set. Yeah. Uh, Okay, 
on NetFlow. So if you ever want to play with a large set of data, so I think this is 90 days. So 90 days, every day, they recorded all the activity between all their computers. And so each one of these, it says it's uh, 1 to 2 gigabytes, but you expand that, it's actually 6 to 7 gigabytes. That's like 100, 100 million rows of data per day. And so you have all these computers sending a bunch of traffic. So let's go back and look at it. So here's, I'm going to make this a little bigger. So they have the start time of the event, how long it lasted, where it came from and where it went to, on what protocol and what port, how many packets were sent, and the size of those packets. So that's a lot of information about network traffic. All right, so here's what the data looks like. <laughs> you know, really exciting. Basically, they've anonymized it, so they are not telling you actually what computer it is. They're giving a computer identifier and a bunch of numbers. Okay, and I think I have this data analyzed over here. All right. We're going to ask, uh, hopefully that pulls open. All right, so because I have a small computer, I only loaded the first million lines. <laughs> but there's 100 million lines in the data, so I'm not going to load that in. I'm going to use Pandas and Network X, and here's all the data. And so I'm going to load. <laughs> this is how this this right here is really important. It's the number of lines to read in off the top of the file, because if I try to load in six gigabytes worth of text data into my memory and I only have four, it would crash. Okay. So I take take that in. And I look at the top. It's just like what the web page advertised. And I can look at how, how large of data that they're sending back and forth. So there's lots of small data, and there's very few large data bits. Right? That's sort of as expected. Your, most of your network traffic is pretty small. And then you can use Network X to visualize all the nodes in the, in the graph. So the problem with this data is it's the network traffic for a day. But I'm only looking at the first like one percent of it, and so the likelihood of seeing any network traffic between any two pairs of computers is pretty low. So the network the network connectivity that I see for the first one percent is almost nothing. So this problem is like pretty standard. If you're trying to see a hundred million nodes worth of data in a graph, it's really tough. And so then, this is a slightly better representation of that same data set. Um, but then, yeah, so the thing that I was kind of getting to is, like, if you, if you take your visualization and you try and label it, it actually reduces the amount of data you can show, right? Because now you're including both the location of the node and the label of the load. And then you can make your problem even worse by trying to label what the edges are. So this computer talked to this one for some duration. So that, that's a much easier story to understand. But the density of the data that I can show you is much lower. Okay, so that was the takeaway there. That's that's like three points out of you know, hundred million. So that's clearly not going to work very well. And I'll skip over property graphs because it's time to go. All right, we can work. We'll skip over that. I think yeah. So there's a a reading and a quiz. So there's no essay with this reading, and the quiz is on the a pain drink algorithm from Google. And then I think, oh yeah. So the homework assignment is to parse your IPYMB files. So you have a set of notebooks. And those notebooks are plain text. So you have Python and can parse those files. I think there's reasonable. Uh, I thought I had. Oh, I think there's a reading assignment in Blackboard, but it's it's the the reading assignment. There's no uh, quiz or essay for so. Mm, no. Oops. Okay. Uh, right. As you find my pen, there it is. <coughs> All 
it's a wild card, so it'd match anything. If all of your folders and files are spread out across the entire drive, then you have a harder problem. But it'd be easy if they were all in one folder. So as long as your Python notebook can read the files, that's all I'm asking. Then pandas shows up once. So how are we switching from the content onto the content? That's a challenge. I mean, it would be it'd be useful, right, to figure out what's in your notebook files, like what what is in them. Yes, that's true. Well, it's a structured text file. If you figure out what type of structure it is, it's much easier. If you open up the notebook, like open up your Python notebook in a text editor, you'll see what kind of file it is. Do we have a question? Let's hold up. Yes. Correct. I will see the output in your notebook. I won't be able to run your notebook. Right? I can't rerun your notebook. You'll have to have run it for me. But I will be able to see the output in your cells, right? Because what I'll see is a list of modules. I'll take your name tags and your expectations for the rest of the semester. Hello? Yes, stop this. 